<gasps> Hello. No, you're not supposed to be. You're supposed to be over there. Very confused she is.
Good morning, everyone. Well, well done for making it to this Grace Church uh, family service. Welcome to everyone who's online. Did you know we're also online at the same time? There's a, a camera just over there. So um, hello to everyone at home. Um, what do I need to say for us this morning? Okay, so those of us who are in the building, we're all in our little socially distanced um, bubbles. We've got a bag of goodies. You'll need that as we go through um, our time together, and I'll tell you what you need and when. So it might be worth letting an adult keep control of those items. And if you're missing anything in your goodie bag, we have more at the back, okay? And just wave at Rob. Rob's wearing the blue top there. Just wave at Rob, and he'll make sure you get what you need. There we go. Um, for those at home, please stay tuned through this family service, and at the end, we're going to broadcast from here um, a Bible reading and a sermon, so just bear with us at the end of our time here, and we'll get that out to you at home. Um, and also, of course, remember that if we want to connect together, we're going to do that on Zoom, and that'll be after that, that sermon comes through online. Okay, well, a few other things. What do I need to say? Um, obviously, the rules in the building are oh, we need to stay in our little bubbles. That's quite important. Wear our face masks as much as we can. Um, use a one-way flow to get out of the building, like that. Um, and uh, I think the thing on the symptoms, I got this wrong the other day. If you get a bad cough or a temperature in the next couple of days, then phone and let us know. And if we need to tell anyone, then we can. Um, so that's just a precaution for us. Uh, let me let you know too about some other things that are coming up ahead. Next Sunday we have a guest service or an adult service um, aimed at us, but also people asking questions about the Christian faith. And uh, we're going to be looking at uncomfortable apathy, when apathy met Jesus. So um, do look out for that. That's next Sunday. Also, we've got Easter coming up, haven't we? And we've got a number of special events for Easter, including on Easter Saturday, we're going to have an Easter trail in the outdoor space around here, learning more about the true Easter story. So do sign up for that. You'll need to book a slot for that, a household slot. Um, but the details are in the church email along with everything else that you need. Well, we are getting near to Easter now, aren't we? It's what? How many weeks away is Easter? Three weeks? Four weeks? Something like that, isn't it? It's very close. So we're thinking this morning about how Jesus came to Jerusalem on his way to heaven, on his way to the cross, on his way to rise again. And we're looking at how did Jesus arrive in Jerusalem? As we think about this together, why don't we start our time by praying? Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you so much that we can meet together in person Thank you that we can remember Jesus. Help us to see him and believe in him and trust him. Help us to listen well and enjoy Jesus, our saviour and king, together. Amen. We well, you know how you arrive somewhere says something about you, doesn't it? Imagine today I'd arrived at church in a motorbike. What would you have thought of me? You thought, wow, Ollie likes going really fast, doesn't he? Um, imagine I'd arrived today on my bicycle. You thought, you think, wow, Ollie's really fit, isn't he? To cycle all the way up East Hill Road to church on a bike. Wow, he's really fit, isn't he? Um, imagine I arrived in a posh Rolls Royce car. You think, wow, Ollie's cool. Well, he's posh, isn't he? Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? Well, how you arrive says something about who you are. And today we're going to see how Jesus arrived in Jerusalem and what it tells us about who he is. But as we start, we remember that the Bible story about Jesus doesn't begin with his arrival in Jerusalem, but began a little while before that. So we're going to uh, listen to a song which reminds us of the whole Bible story. And uh, we've got some instruments. If you need some instruments, there's more at the back. We've got some instruments we can play, and we're going to enjoy this song that reminds us of the Bible story up to this point. So let's stand up and enjoy our first song. It's the King's Song. We're going back in time now to the time of King David. Let's go! A long, 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 long time ago, God made a promise He would send a king. A great, 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 great grandson promised to David He would be a great king who would rule forevermore. Time 
travellers travelling through time to the time of Isaiah. Here we go. A long, 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 long time ago, God sent a prophet to describe his king. Wonderful, powerful, peaceful, eternal, he will have a kingdom. It will have no end, he is the king of everyone. King. Less long but still quite long ago God spoke to Mary You will have a son The great 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 grandson Promised to David You will call him Jesus And his kingdom will not end What? Never ever ever? I've said to you, um, how you arrive says something about who you are, the kind of things that you, al- you like, how important you are. Now, I was wondering, if you wanted to make a grand arrival, what you would choose to make a grand arrival. And I've got some pictures on the screen, and in your bags, you've got a piece of paper that's got the same thing as on the screen. And I wondered if you could tell me, if you wanted to make a grand arrival, what you would like to arrive in. Would you choose a war horse? Would you choose a Ferrari? Oh. Would you choose a, 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 a baby donkey? Would you choose, have you seen these in town, these barrel bikes? Would you choose a barrel scooter? Or maybe a limousine, that's a really trendy limousine, isn't it? Hold up your piece of paper and point at the one that you might choose. There's some, there's some plain paper in there, and if you'd like to draw something else, you could. What have we got here? Lucas is going with a limousine, yeah. William's going for a Ferrari. What have we got? Immy's going for the baby donkey. Okay, illusions of grandeur there. Oh, yeah. What have you found? Have you found something? Yeah. Cool, that's good, isn't it? Well, look, I want to tell you this morning about how Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. You can put that down now. You can take that home later. Let's have a look at how Jesus arrived in Jerusalem. Let's see what the Bible says. Here we go. After Jesus said this, he went on to Jerusalem. And then he sent two of his followers. He said to them, "Uh, um, uh, go into that town. Uh, Yeah, yeah, go into that town. You can see over there. And when you enter it, you'll find a colt, a baby donkey. And, uh, when, uh, and no one has ever ridden this colt. Untie it, bring it here to me. And if anyone asks you why you're taking it, say, the master has need of it. Now, is it me? Or is that really strange? Is that really strange? I mean, who would choose a baby donkey to make a grand arrival on? What a funny thing to choose. It's very strange, isn't it? And I thought, you know, it's also strange how Jesus gets this donkey. See, Jesus says to his disciples, over there in that town, you'll find a baby donkey. How does Jesus know that? He knows exactly where the donkey is, and he knows exactly what will happen. The master will say, oi, what are you doing with my donkey? (laughs) And Jesus knows exactly what to say. And, you know, we were told, weren't we, about this donkey... 
It's a donkey that no one has ever ridden on before. Wow, that's, that's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? Has anyone here ever ridden on a horse? Yeah? Yeah. You know, Henry has a friend at school called Stewie. I'm going to show you a picture of Stewie because he sent it to me. And Stewie has got a Shetland pony. And this is Stewie in his Shetland pony called Min Min. And, and look what he's, he's wearing a helmet and he's got all his proper clothes on. And um, it looks like Min Min is well trained there, doesn't it? I think if I ask Stewie <laughs> whether you should ever get on an untrained horse or donkey, I think Stewie would say, no, don't do it. You want to go on a donkey that's been well trained. But look, here's Jesus. And Jesus knows exactly where this donkey is. He knows exactly what will happen. And he even chooses an uncontrollable, untrained donkey. And he's going to get on it and control it completely. Wow. Wow, it's amazing. Now, here's Jesus. And he, he knows everything. He can control everything. And he can even take anything he wants. Uh, and, you know, it's like Jesus is taking your car. <laughs> That's the kind of funny thing it is about it. Now, I thought we'd do a test this morning. Okay. Now, if you asked your parents, you say, I need to borrow the car. Do you think they would say yes? Why don't we try it? Let's try a little experiment in the room. Say, um, say to your responsible adult who's with you, can I borrow the car? Can I have the car keys? I wonder if anyone will have any success if you've got a car with you. Maybe you've got just some house keys. Maybe you can borrow those. Can anyone get hold of any car, car keys? No. Shall we, try, shall we try with me? Now, um, there's Hannah at the back. Hannah, you know me, don't you? You know I'm an excellent driver. Can I borrow your car? I just need to borrow it for a little errand. Not today. <laughs> Not today. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. It's pretty mad, that, isn't it? Jesus, you see, he turns up. And he, does this donkey belong to Jesus? It doesn't seem to, but Jesus says, I'm the master. And he can take what he wants. He's like the king who turns up in town and says, I need a horse. And it's like, you're the king. You can have it. Do you see? Jesus is amazing. Who is this man who can do all of these things? Well, our next song is going to help us to think about that question together. Who is Jesus? So we'll stand up and we'll enjoy our next song together. Let's do that. Hello, hello. We're going to sing a song about Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Son of God. And we're going to praise him as we sing this song together. <laughs> He's the King of Kings, he's the Lord of Lords, he can heal the sick, he can calm the storm, he's the Son of God, he can save us from sin, and he calls us to follow him. You know what, I actually think this song would be better if we had someone playing piano and maybe singing along with us. So, hey Philip, hey. why don't you join us? Love to. Oh, I should probably move over. Uh, yeah, just a little bit more. Some more room? Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Shall we sing? One, two, three, four. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He can heal the sick. He can calm the storm. He's the son of God. He can save us from sin. And he calls us to follow him. Jesus said a man covered in disease.
have a seat. That's great. So Jesus has got his donkey. He's got his way of arriving in Jerusalem. But what happens next? Well, let's see what happens next in our, in our Bible story this morning. The disciples brought the donkey to Jesus and they threw their coats on the back of the donkey. And they put Jesus on it. And then as Jesus rode towards Jerusalem, the followers spread their coats on the floor. Ah, wow. And Jesus was coming close to Jerusalem, and the whole crowd of followers was very happy. They began shouting praise to God for all the powerful works they'd seen. They said, guess what the crowd said? They said, God bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. There is peace in heaven. And glory to God. So, I'll put that back. So Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on a donkey and people go mad. I mean, is that weird or what? You know, when someone arrives in a donkey, on a donkey, would we get excited? I think we'd get excited about someone arriving in a Ferrari, wouldn't we? But here, people get very excited. And did you see they threw their coats on the floor? Now, did anyone here come wearing a nice coat? I wonder if you could show me your nice coat. I've got a few nice show, co- coats, and I'm going to show you them. Here's my, uh, this is my old city coat. Can you see this? Look at this lovely blue lining. It's been in the back of a cupboard for a while, because I haven't worn it for a while. But this is my nice city coat. Has anyone else got a nice coat you can show me? Well, the people put their coats on the floor, see? Whether they had a good coat, a nice coat, maybe they only had one coat, but everyone started throwing their coats on the floor. Look at that like that and look here's this is my favorite this is my favorite suit jacket look at this i'm going to show you this one here it is i call this my green goblin jacket it's got this lovely green lining hey how cool is that do you think that's cool yeah and people started getting their coats and they threw them on the floor now i wasn't planning on throwing my coat on the floor but hey things happen don't they would anyone like to add a coat to my line here anyone like to add a coat you can The people started throwing their coats on the floor, yeah. You're going to lay a coat on the floor? Thank you. (laughs) Well done, that's great. Yeah. Now, what's that? It's like they're laying out the red carpet, isn't it? It's like they're laying a special pathway for a king. You see, Jesus arrives on a donkey, and what do the people think? They think, donkey donkey, Jesus must be king. Donkey, you're the king, Jesus. Now, why do they think that? Why do they think Jesus must be the king? Well, look, they remember something from long ago in the Bible. Look at this. This was what the Bible story said. Look at this from Zechariah. God said, rejoice, people of Jerusalem. Shout for joy, people of Jerusalem. Your king is coming to you. He does what's right. He saves. He's gentle Riding on a donkey. He is on the colt of a donkey. Now you remember why it's so important that Jesus went and got that donkey, wasn't it? Because this was how the king arrives. The king arrives on a donkey. You see, here is Jesus, and he's deliberately fulfilling the Bible story, showing that he is God's special king. His special rescuing king arrives on a donkey and everyone goes mad now i wanted to do a little reenactment of everyone having a big party at jesus arriving and i thought we'd sing and i thought we'd cheer but we're not really allowed to sing are we we're not really allowed to cheer so what i thought we would do is i'm gonna say god is king uh, jesus is king rather and when i say that we'll do it a couple of times i want you to get your streamers here has everyone got a green streamer yeah your green streamer, I want you to just go wave it around like this. Wave it around like this, okay, when I say Jesus is king. Now, if you really want to make a mess of the church for me and Steve to tidy up later, <laughs> then we've also got some confetti. <laughs> so when I say God is king, you can get, there should be a fistful for everyone in there. You can go, just throw the confetti like that. See, I've already made a mess. So we might as well go for it, hey. All right, here we go. So stand up, everyone, and I'm gonna, we're going to get a feel for what this was like, okay, when Jesus arrived. You got your streamers. Has everyone got some confetti? If you need some confetti, ask Rob. Everyone got some? Yeah? Okay, three, two, one. Everyone ready? 
Three, two, one. Jesus is king. Hooray. Yeah, we're not supposed to do the shouting. <laughs> Jesus is it. One, two, three. Jesus is king. Hooray. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Jesus is king. Yes. Yes. Woo. Yes. Look at that. Woo. So I think, you know, I think it would have been very exciting. You can have a seat now. It would have been very exciting. Everyone was so excited, you know. They sung that song from the Old Testament about how Jesus is the king. This was the day of the end of evil. This was the day when God's rescuing, conquering king arrived. And our next song is going to show us some of the passion and some of the excitement <laughs> that the people had on that day. So let's enjoy our next song and we can do some more cheering, can't we? All right, so this is a song about what it would have been like on that day when everyone cheered. Here we go. I can see you enjoy that confetti there. That was great. Well, you know, there was a big party, wasn't there? And we've had a bit of a party here when Jesus arrived. He arrived on the donkey. He's the master. He's the king. But you know what? Not everyone that day were excited about the arrival of Jesus on the donkey. Have a look in your Bible stories. Let's have a look on the screen at what happened. Because some people didn't celebrate Jesus. Some of the Pharisees said to Jesus... Teacher, tell your follower not to say these things. The Pharisees said to, to all the followers and the disciples, you shouldn't be saying Jesus is the king. Stop saying it. You know, sometimes there are things that we're not supposed to say, aren't there? So you shouldn't say oi to your teacher, should you? You shouldn't say oi, teacher. <laughs> That's not the done thing, is it? And you shouldn't call your friends silly, should you, really? And the Pharisees say, you shouldn't call Jesus the king. You shouldn't call him the special Messiah, God's rescuing king. But did Jesus agree with them? Well, no, he didn't. Look what Jesus said. Look what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Jesus said, I tell you, if my followers don't say these things, 
then the stones will cry out. Jesus says, they should absolutely sing that I'm the king. If they don't, do you know what? Do you know what will happen? The stones are going to sing out. You see, I am God's king. And God's king is enthroned in praise. God's king is celebrated. If, I didn't, if they didn't call me the king, this is actually quite a small thing. A bit of this and that, Jesus says, a bit of this. It's quite a small thing. You should see what would happen if you weren't singing. Oh, then you'd see. The stones themselves would cry out and celebrate God's king. So what I would like you to do is, in your bags, you've got some stones. Yeah. I'm afraid you don't have any stones at home. You'll have to find your own. <laughs> you've got some stones, and you should have a felt-tip pen as well. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to draw a little face on your stone and maybe a speech bubble that says, Jesus is God's king. Maybe don't throw them. <laughs> yes, there we go. That, that was always a potential risk in the risk assessment. Um, so colour in your, um, your stone. You might like to take it home. I've only given you a few pens, so you might want glue and glitter and stuff like that at home. But have a go at drawing your stone. And while you're doing that, I've got some questions for you to talk about with your adults. So they're on a piece of paper in your pack, there's some questions, and um, the adults have got the answers on their piece of paper, but on the screen here for everyone at home, you just got the questions, you've got to work it out. So why don't you have a go at drawing your stone, and there's some discussion questions there for you to have a chat about. Is that okay in your packs? Off you go. <laughs> Have you found your questions, Lucas? Hello. Do the pens work? They yeah. yeah, okay, that's good. It's always a winner when they work. Well, that's the challenge. You've started here, so you've got to complete it when you get home, haven't you? Have you found your questions in your bag there, Lucas? See if you can find those. Yeah, there you go. See if you can do those with mum. And you can start at the top, you see. You can start at the top and do as many as you can. William, you think it's a ball, don't you? You're supposed to be doing artwork. Oh, my, oh, the face. Sorry, William. Oh, wow. One of the stones crying out, Jesus is king. That's brilliant. That's fab. Thank you so much. That's great. Alfie, have you got a stone at the back? Have you done one? Yeah, you've done one? All right. <laughs> I hope everyone at home is getting on all right with their, uh, with their questions. If they can read them. Mm. How are you getting on? Do you need a little bit longer or have you done it? Have you done your questions? You've, you've done it? All right, great. All right, everyone, who can show me a stone that you've got then? Who can show me a stone? Look at that. Fabulous. You see, what you can do with felt tips and a stone. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, look at that. Hey, guys, I love the colours. It's brilliant. I'm sure you can make that even better. Did anyone manage to do the speech bubble? Right, Jesus is king. Yeah. Wow, that's fab, guys. So now we can remember with our stones, what would have happened if the people didn't cry out that Jesus is king? You know, Jesus, uh, Jesus went to Jerusalem again, you know. A couple of days after this, a few days later, Jesus went to Jerusalem again. And uh, he was crowned with a crown of thorns. He was clothed with a purple robe. And he was put on a throne, except this throne was a cross, you know. And, you know, in Matthew's Gospel, it says that as Jesus died on the cross, do you know what happened? There was an earthquake. The earth shook. You see, Jesus said the stones would cry out that he was the king, and it happened when he was on the cross, and it happened when he rose again. The earth, the stones themselves, shook and declared, Jesus is the king. And you know, I'm excited, because imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus, the true king of all the world, returns. The Bible says that the world is groaning. The whole of creation is groaning for Jesus the king to come back. And so you can use your stone 
to remind you of that. You know, we've seen this morning, haven't we, that Jesus is the master. He knows everything. He controls anything. He can take everything. He's the king. It all belongs to him. We saw how the people saw that he was the king. He arrived on the donkey deliberately to show that he was the king. And we've seen how the world had to sing his praise because he's the king enthroned in praise. Jesus' arrival shows us that he is God's special rescuing king worth singing praise and celebrating. So when we finish our time, we're going to pray and we're going to sing his praise in our hearts. Let's pray together, everyone. Father God, thank you that Jesus is the master. Thank you that he showed us he is the king. Thank you that he came gladly to be our rescuing king. And Father, we look forward to the day when he is crowned in praise and we look forward to his return, for he is our king and our saviour. Amen. Well, why don't we stand up? If you've got any confetti left, you can enjoy that in our last song and you use your instruments as well. Let's stand up and lift up our voices in our hearts. grab a seat grab a seat I hope you've had lots of fun this morning 
And I hope you've learned something about who Jesus is through his grand arrival. Now, I've got to turn something on for the adults at home. (laughs) So stay here. Don't run away just yet. And I'll talk to you in a minute. I'm just going to send uh, the reading and uh, the preach through the internet to the adults as well. So, um, so bye from all the families at home, but stay online, and uh, we're sending you the sermon now. <laughs> the reading today is taken from 2 Peter, verse 2, starting just after verse 10. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Let's, uh, with this passage in front of us, uh, let's bow our heads and pray as we come to have a look at it together. Peter writes, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that your uh, word Uh, was not simply spoken by men, but spoken by men as they were carried along by your Holy Spirit so that your word is your breathed out word. Uh, We pray that we would approach it with humility and trust as we open it up together now. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I wonder how uh, how close you've come to being scammed 
Um, you know, uh, maybe some doorstep scam, or I guess more often these days it's a phone scam or an internet scam, isn't it? Um, it seems to me that, that either they are getting more clever or I am getting more stupid um, because they can be increasingly hard to spot, can't they? These guys don't wear labels, do they, that say, you know, sort of scammer, you know, don't come near me with a barge pole. Um, they, they entice us, don't they, with... with uh, uh, smooth talking words or familiar logos or they try to dupe us into something that promises much but delivers uh, little, nothing. And, and uh, sadly, we've had to wise up, haven't we, about the, the reality of such scams. We've, we've had to do our due diligence, uh, as it were, before we trust what people are trying to sell us. Um, and, and it seems to me that, that this passage here um, is where Peter helps us to do our due diligence uh, when it comes to those who we trust to teach us. Because false teachers exist. He's, he's shown us that in the first half of, of, of chapter 2, hasn't he? And, and they're not harmless, but they're destructive to God's people. So he's warned us about their character so that we're not surprised, verses 1 to 3. He's reassured us about their fate so that we're not unduly worried uh, in verses 4 to 10. And he's doing all of this because the purpose of his letter to them is that they grow in godliness, which, which he knows comes, chapter 1 verse verse 3, through the knowledge of him who called us. In other words, in, in the context of these false teachers that operate within the church, he's reminding them that it matters what we teach. He's warned them not to be naive about this. False teachers are a, a reality. They've always been with us and they're still with us. And, and he's given them this general description of the character, the fate uh, of the false teachers. But now, here in these uh, verses, he, he's getting specific. He's kind of given us a, a more detailed description of what marks out these false teachers who were influencing the churches that he's writing to. So he doesn't kind of name names, but he does describe carefully what they're like so that his readers can spot the, the presence and the influence of such people in their own congregations. Um, he anticipates, if you like, the, the question from his readers, which actually might be a question on our minds too, um, that, that given that false teachers are real and they're destructive and that they don't wear labels saying spiritual scammer or, or something, how do we recognize such people so, so that we don't get scammed? What, what will they be like? What will mark them out? Well, Peter draws attention here, I, I, I think, to both the character and the influence of, of the false teacher. What marks them out and what outcomes their ministry results in. So let's have a look. If, if false teachers don't wear labels, how are we going to recognize them? Well, first of all, let's look at the character of the false teacher in verses 10 to 16, where, where the, the, the first way that we're going to recognize these people, says Peter, is by their arrogant blasphemy. Look at the second half of verse 10 with me. Bold and willful, they do not tremble, as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will be destroyed in their destruction. Those are pretty uh, pokey verses, aren't they? But I think they're also quite tricky verses, to be honest, to, to try and pick out uh, what, what Peter's accusing them of exactly. But it seems as though uh, they were making uh, slanderous accusations towards angels, what he calls the glorious ones at the end of verse 10. Uh, but that's made a bit complicated by the fact that these glorious ones are then contrasted with angels in verse 11. So, so maybe the best way to make sense of it is to see that these, these false teachers are, are slandering evil or fallen angels, uh, something they're not entitled to do. 
So, so not even God's angels. Verse 11, who are both greater in might and power than those fallen angels, would, would bring such slanderous accusations. That these angels may now be fallen, they might be servants of Satan, but, but that's for God alone to deal with. It, it's certainly not for these false teachers in their arrogance to, to pass comment on such things as the angels themselves leave to the Lord. It's, it's a bit of an obscure uh, few verses, uh, I think, not, not easy to unravel. But the sin of the false teachers, and, and so therefore the point that, that Peter's making, that I think is clear enough, isn't it? That they are willful or arrogant, verse 10. In other words, they're full of it. You know, what, what audacity, what, what inflated egos that, that they would presume to pour scorn and, and slander on, on those of whom they know so little. What do they know about dealings in the angelic realm? What insight do they have into such things that they presume to make such slanderous comments? So Peter says, verse 12, they are blaspheming about matters of which they're ignorant. And, and to blaspheme is to uh, deny the Lord and his truth. So, so in their arrogance, with their lack of humility, that they bring slanderous accusations which amount to the denying of God's truth. In contrast with, uh, 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 the holy, uh, with, the, with God's angels, verse 11, who, who despite being greater in might and power, don't display that kind of arrogance, but, but rather they, they demonstrate humility towards what God has said. In, in other words, they recognize that God is all-knowing, not, not them. They recognize their own lack of understanding in such matters, and, and so they exercise humble obedience to what God has plainly said, not, not arrogant slander. Did you see the point? And friends, that, that, you know, the application I think is obvious, isn't it? Remember that Peter's warning here is about those who teach and influence God's people. And, and how, how many church leaders today seem to choose all too readily to simply throw away the teachings and the morality of God in the, in the Scriptures because they've, they've become kind of inconvenient truths to hold in the modern world. How easily it, it seems the unchanging word of God gets discarded when we decide that the, the demands it makes on our lives are, are no longer wanted. You know, I, I guess the obvious uh, current example would be in the area of, of human sexuality, wouldn't it? In, in a world where the, the prevailing culture sees uh, sex as, as simply you know, a, a recreational activity between pretty much any combination of consenting adults it's really inconvenient isn't it that that the clear the the unambiguous teaching of God's word is that sex belongs to marriage between one man and one woman who, who have covenanted themselves to each other in in a lifelong one flesh relationship in in, in marriage two people covenant to become one and, and sex is the expression of that one flesh bond. It's the embodiment, if you like, of, of their unity. Now, of course, we, we shouldn't be surprised that the culture around us doesn't see, uh, doesn't see sex in that way. And it wants to decide for itself what sex is for and how sex is to be, be used. We shouldn't be surprised that the culture does that. But friends, how easily it seems some teachers in the church are prepared to simply unpick and, and excuse away what God plainly says. But to do so, Peter's point here, is to be guilty of blasphemy, of denying what God has plainly said. And, and that is an arrogant thing to do because it presumes to know better than God. He calls such people, look in verse 12, uh, like irrational animals, creatures 
of instinct. That's, that's a pretty shocking language, actually, that he uses, isn't it? The, these false teachers, he says, by, by their, their arrogant blasphemy, they show themselves to be kind of devoid of spiritual understanding, like, like the animals are, just, just creatures of instinct who, who don't have a clue about spiritual matters, about arrogance and humility, about sin and fidelity, about judgment and salvation, about angels, you know, godly and, and fallen, because they pour scorn on them, that they, they despise and slander them but such people end of verse 12 are are on a road that will lead to their destruction and I I think he's got in mind here seems to have in mind uh, animals that are killed either for food or or maybe for sacrifice you'll, you'll notice in verse 12 he calls them animals born to be caught and destroyed which makes the point a bit of a chilling one, really, doesn't it? That the, the false teacher's fate, their, their ultimate destruction, will be every bit as certain and final as those animals who are reared in order to be killed. And he, he kind of backs that up in verse 13 by assuring his, his readers that punishment will be given, that they will suffer wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, or they'll be paid back with harm for the harm that they have done. Do you see? The, the, the arrogant way in which these false teachers blaspheme what God has said will result in them suffering wrong for their wrongdoing the wrongdoing that they have brought on God's people by their false teaching. Friends, the, um, the, the force of this just can't escape us, can it? And Peter wants us to see here that the complete intolerance of God towards false teachers, that those who would blaspheme and pour scorn on what God has said, those who would throw out his teachings in order to make their lives more comfortable or more pleasurable or more politically correct, God will not tolerate that. These people are destined for destruction. It's really hard teaching, isn't it? And, and friends, that the lesson for us here is that we must be equally intolerant of false teaching in our churches, mustn't we? Hard though that may be, uh, unpopular though that may be, we surely must recognise, as as Peter does here, that that those who teach falsely are doing harm to God's people. And if we love God's people, and if we love the truth of what God has said, well, then it must make us contenders for the truth and and not tolerant, therefore, of, of false teaching. So what else uh, does Peter teach us about the character of the false teacher? Um, if, if they don't wear labels, uh, you know, how else are we going to uh, recognize them? Well, not just by their arrogant blasphemy, but also, look, second half of verse 13, by their hedonistic desires. Have a look at the end of verse 13. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Now, um, (laughs) don't let these verses put you off pleasurable experiences you know in in his grace God gives us lots of things for our pleasure God God is no killjoy He, he gives us a world full of pleasurable places and experiences to enjoy you know things that all of us find enjoyable like hammock camping yeah uh or or like smelly cheese um or or like hot curries those those kind of things (laughs) but of course for the Christian Actually, for the Christian, the deepest pleasure, the most profound pleasure, is to be found in the pursuit of living to please the God that we love. Living as he's designed us to live for our ultimate pleasure and and flourishing. But it's not this kind of pleasure that the false teachers have in mind, is it? Um, the, the, the Greek word that's used here for pleasure, look in verse 13, it is where we get the word hedonist 
from. And, and a hedonist, of, of course, is someone who lives for the pursuit of his own pleasure and, and gratification. Such, such that everything else takes, takes second place to him um, uh, indulging himself in, in every, uh, every sinful desire, every excess, every uh, abuse, just, just all things in the name of pleasure. And, and notice that their idea of pleasure, verse 13, is to revel. The, the word uh, literally means to uh, make themselves kind of feeble through indulgence or through excess. So, so the picture is one of, of sexual promiscuity and self-indulgence and drunkenness and excess. In other words, pursuing the desires of the sinful nature. And, and doing so brazenly, openly, because they're doing it in broad daylight. <laughs> In, in, in Peter's time, if, if people were going to indulge themselves in that way, they'd, they'd do it under cover of night. They'd do it in secret to avoid the shame of being seen. But, but here, these false teachers, they're without shame. They're, they're indulging their passions in broad daylight, celebrating them. So Peter calls them, verse 14, blots and blemishes. Um, as we'll see at the end of chapter 3, Peter is going to call his readers to holy living such that they are found when Christ returns as people without spot or blemish. So it's, it's kind of easy to see the contrast here with these false teachers, isn't it? Far from practicing holy living and, and far from being without spots and blemish, these false teachers are, are living lives which are the very opposite to the holy lives required of God's people. It's quite a graphic picture, isn't it? But look, he gets more pointed in, in verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children and, and the focus here is on their sexual sin every woman they look at they look at lustfully their their appetite for sin is insatiable they never stop and, and by teachers living this way they're a danger to the young and vulnerable christian they entice unsteady souls verse 14 those those who are um, not firmly established yet in the truth and, and so are vulnerable targets for for being uh, seduced by their teaching and and by the 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 immoral activities that accompany them uh, you'll notice look in verse 15 uh, peter uses the example of balaam from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Do you remember uh, Balaam? Uh, one, one of my commentaries calls him the prophet who worked for profit. Um, in other words, he, he loved to make money. You know, but by selling his, his blessings or his curses. You can read about it in, uh, in Numbers 22. And, and Peter here has just accused these false teachers in verse 14 of having hearts trained in greed. In other words, they're, they're experts in it. And, and as such, they're just like Balaam, who worked for profit. And he's accused them in verse 12 of being like irrational animals, like, like brute beasts with no spiritual wisdom. And, and Numbers 22 records how Balaam was so spiritually blind that even his donkey showed more spiritual awareness than he did. <laughs> and, and Peter has also accused these false teachers of enticing unsteady souls. And, and Numbers 31 records how Balaam is found to be encouraging God's people in, in sexual promiscuity with the Moabites. So what an example this guy Balaam turns out to be of the sinfulness of these false teachers who, who by their ungodly behavior are leading young Christians astray. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, Peter spends just as much time, maybe even more here, on their sinful actions as he does on their wrongful teachings. And, and very often, as we've noted before, these, these two things go together. False teaching usually leads to immoral living. But friends, I do think we need to exercise some humility here, don't we? Because actually all of us are guilty of failing to live as God would have us live. We, we all still do many wrong things things and and so continually need to seek his forgiveness and and this is just as much the case for those who teach as for those who don't that the, the struggle to practice what you preach is is a real struggle 
However, Jesus says of of false prophets in in Matthew 7, by their fruit you will know them. In, In other words, false teaching is often shown up by sinful lifestyle. So the the question is, what kind of of picture of the Christian life is painted by the lifestyle of those who teach it? People will learn as much from how you live as from what you teach. And this is never more true than when it's applied to teachers within the church. Guys, our lives, our behaviour, our actions are under scrutiny. And there'll be a huge part of our witness to the truth of the gospel. And and clearly here, that the picture of the Christian life that was being painted by these false teachers was both blasphemous and damaging to God's people. And, And friends, sadly, it can be the same today, can't it? We need only uh, look at our news feeds or newspapers to see a a kind of steady trickle of of Christian leaders whose moral conduct has been more than a match for their false teaching. In in fact, sadly, we've also seen teachers with, with orthodox beliefs whose moral conduct has been just as depraved. And clearly, we're obliged not to try and cover that up but to call it out, to condemn it. And friends, it will be judged by the Lord. But friends, even more than that, we should let these verses drive us, shouldn't we, to to humility and to prayerfulness, that we may not fall prey to the same thing. Please pray for those who teach us, including me, that God would keep us humble before his word, not presuming to know better, lest we fall as others have. Please pray that God would keep the teachers of his word faithful and and sound in their teaching, and, and that it would lead by God's grace to holy living, that would glorify him and not blaspheme him, that would build up his people and and not lead them on a path to destruction. So if false teachers don't wear labels, how are we going to recognize them? Well, he's shown us something of their character, hasn't he? Their, Their arrogant blasphemy, their hedonistic desires... But now, I think, um, from verse 17 onwards, he, he shows us something of their, maybe their influence or, or, or the, the outcomes, the devastating outcomes that their ministry results in. And, and the first of these, you, you'll notice, is that their ministries are empty and useless. You know, like, like the internet or telephone scam. Much is promised, but nothing is delivered. Have a look at verse 17. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Um, when, uh, uh, when Esther and I were on, on sabbatical, we were, uh, we were walking in the Lake District. We come down the side of a, of a mountain um, to, to a place where the ground was, was particularly uh, sort of saturated with water. And, and as we moved across the, the ground, we could see why the ground was so wet. And, and it was because there were kind of underground springs. They were bubbling up to the surface. It was great, actually. You could actually see them sort of bubbling up through the grass. And, and I'm sure it kept the grass really, really lush and, and green, of course, which I'll bet the farmer uh, was, was very thankful for if there was a, a drought or, or anything like that, because a good spring like that would be invaluable, wouldn't it, in a, in a time of, of drought? But, but on the other hand, of course, verse 17, a waterless spring, well, that's pretty useless, isn't it? And it's the same in, in verse 17 with, with mists driven by a storm. When, when there's a drought going on and the ground is, is dry, well, a good storm to produce some rain is going to be a welcome sight. But a storm that just kind of pushes around the mist, well, that does no good at all, does it? And, and, and this is Peter's point. Someone called to teach must be able to feed 
God's people, to equip them for works of service, to build them up to spiritual maturity so that they can be effective disciples of the Lord Jesus. But these false teachers are useless. They serve no purpose. Why? Verse 18, because they speak loud bursts of folly. Their their words are hollow. In other words, they say nothing of spiritual significance, nothing to build God's people up to holy living, nothing to equip them to be about Christ's mission uh, in the world. Instead, verse 18, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. And and I think, again, there's particularly new Christians he's got in in mind there. Many of uh, uh, the Christians that Peter's writing to here were new converts from paganism. So they were therefore quite used to living lives of of sexual promiscuity, of self-indulgence. And these false teachers are enticing them by appealing to the the sinful uh, passions of the flesh that they'd recently left behind to follow Christ. And by their words and by their actions, they were saying to them that these things were okay. They they had freedom to do so. But this this so-called freedom, verse 19, did nothing more than make them slaves of corruption, slaves to their sinful desires. Do do you see the point? They, They promise freedom. But what kind of freedom were they promising? Well, obviously not freedom from sin and corruption, verse 19, because they themselves were slaves to such desires. And Peter gives us a a little proverb at the end of verse 19 there, doesn't he? For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. In in other words, people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. And and these false teachers have been mastered by by sin and and by depravity and by self-indulgence. And friends, there there are loads of teachings around today, aren't there, that promise freedom. But what do they promise freedom from? And what do they promise freedom for? Because, friends, the Bible teaches us that we're only truly free as we come to know Jesus Christ as our rescuer and our ruler. And that true freedom is freedom from sin, not f- and freedom for serving Christ. And so anything which promises freedom whilst redefining sin or redefining Christ, well, it can't deliver what it promises. It's just a scam. So, friends, there's a, there's a warning here for all of us, isn't there? Because none of us are beyond temptation, which is Partly why, of course, Peter's so concerned that we grow in godliness and wake up to the reality of false teachers. It's because their, their ministries are empty and useless. They promise what they can never deliver. Which leads us to the, the, the final thing that Peter wants to show us here about the, the influence of these false teachers or the outcomes that their ministry results in. Because not only are, are their ministries empty and useless... But verses 20 to 22, they're also unable to deliver. And and we can see this because although they claim to be Christians, to to be those who have, uh, verse 20, escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So although they claim to be Christians, and and they may well have a a head knowledge of, of the way of salvation, Yet now, through, through their false teaching, their, their immoral behaviour, their true colours, if you like, are showing through. They are, again, verse 20, entangled in them and overcome. And it reminds us again, maybe, of, of Jesus' words, doesn't it? In, in Matthew 7, by their fruit you will know them. And, and these false teachers here are, are, are being shown by their fruit not to be truly God's people at all. In fact, Jesus explains it further in in Matthew 7, doesn't he? When he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say, did we not prophesy in your name and, and drive out demons and perform miracles? Then I will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. And that's what we're seeing here, isn't it? that false teachers can show many outward signs of being genuinely saved 
Christians, they, they may have good Bible knowledge, they might be gifted communicators, they might uh, uh, show spiritual gifts, but ultimately their teaching and their lifestyle will expose them. And, and for such people, Peter says, verse 21, it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to have turned back or turned away from it. Do you see? And friends, that's so incredibly sad, isn't it? When someone we know, you know, maybe someone we thought had made a, a commitment to Christ seems to have abandoned their faith. I, I've known several such people over the years, some of whom, to my knowledge, have still not returned to the Lord. It's incredibly sad. Were they, were they never truly saved? Have they just backslidden? Well, the Lord knows, and time will tell. But how much greater the tragedy is when someone who once knew, in, in their heads at least, the way of truth has now distorted it and is leading others of God's people astray by both their false teaching and its associated sinful behavior. And I'm sad to say, I know some people in this category too. Maybe you do as well. They've heard the, the life-giving message of the gospel, but having heard it, they've turned from it back to the corruption of their old ways. Like a dog, verse 22, returns to its own vomit. Or like a pig returns to wallow in its mud. Well, Peter says, such will be their judgment that it will be worse for them than if they had never heard of Christ at all. Friends, that is so desperately tragic, isn't it? But, but it shows us that we cannot judge our Christian leaders and teachers by, by their appearance or by their following or, or by their popularity or by their book sales or by their TV channels or, or whatever it is. Rather, we need to judge them by their faithfulness to the teaching of the Scriptures and, and by the humility and the holiness of their lives and, and the lives of those who sit under their ministries. And friends, we need to take to heart the teaching of that little proverb there in verse 22, don't we? Do you see it? That, that the results of the false teachers' ministries are, are unable to deliver. They do nothing more than turn those who teach it and those who follow it away from the life-giving truth of the gospel back to the corruption of their old ways, like a dog returns to its vomit or a pig to its mud. Which, friends, is another way of saying, of course, that it's only the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that can actually transform lives. Only his work on the cross and the Spirit's work within us can give us uh, new lives, new hearts and a new start. No other message or, or distortion of the true message, however well-intentioned it might be, can change our sinful nature. So friends, let's, uh, let's allow this warning from God's Word to, to both uh, wake us up to, to the reality of, of false teaching within the church so, so that we would do a proper due diligence on, on those who we allow to teach us and, and that we would also have fresh confidence to proclaim the biblical gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only one that can change hearts and lives. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for, uh, for both the warning of this passage, but, but also the confidence it can give us in the true gospel of the Lord Jesus. Uh, do please help us to, uh, to wise up to the scammers, uh, rejecting the false gospels that don't deliver. Um, help us too to proclaim with confidence the, the life-giving gospel that uh, by the work of your Spirit can give uh, new hearts and 
fresh start. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, coffee is going to follow shortly on Zoom. Um, but let's close now, shall we, with a, a final song together uh, to sing of where our confidence can be placed.
right, guys, well done for surviving uh, our family service and our slightly clunky um, uh, sermon and so on at the end and final song, but you made it so far. Um, we're going to go on Zoom now, so uh, we'll join you for some coffee in, uh, in just a moment. Terrific. Well done, guys. See you soon. <laughs>